How different are the adult children of same-sex families? That is the question that we are going to talk tonight in this special edition program here in TV7. Welcome. Uh, this is a very hot topic issue here in Finland, but also internationally, of course, because the discussion about the gender-neutral marriage law and all related issues are very live issue today. And today, I'm honored to have a special guest here in our program, uh, Mark Regneros. Did I pronounce that right? Regneros. Regneros. Okay, just Mark, maybe. Sure, that's the... fine. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Mark Regneros is Associate Professor of Sociology at uh, University of Texas uh, at Austin uh, and a Senior Fellow uh, at the Austin Institute for the Study of Family and Culture. Uh, his areas of research are sexual behavior and family formation. He has authored two books. I think the third one is coming. Mm -hmm. And um, his own research uh, on the adult children of parents who have same-sex relationships was published in July 2012 and a follow-up study in August 2012 which uh, responded uh, to, uh, to the critics of that study. Uh, I'm happy to have you here, Mark Regneros. Your name is well known even here in Finland. <laughs> Your critics Crazy. as well know you. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> yeah. But but let's let's start by by question and why why is this issue such a hot topic? Right. Well, it, it's the combination of two topics that are already kind of intense to begin with. Um, for years I had studied heterosexual behavior, and then when, in, in this case, when I moved over briefly into uh, same-sex relationships, that, that automatically elevates its kind of um, intensity and energy and uh, concern. But then you combine that with parenting, which no matter who you're, talk who you're talking about in parenting, it's a, an issue fraught with some degree of emotion uh, because people are very invested in um, the idea of themselves as decent or good enough parents and things like that and, and what's best for children. So you combine those two topics and it's, it can be explosive. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, th there has been a huge uh, research done on the family structures during the past decades. Uh, it's, it's not yes. just on, on this issue. Right. Uh, Family structure has an, a pretty old research history, and so we've known a lot about that for quite some time. What do we mean when we speak about family structure? Right. Uh, I was about to say, it's getting more difficult to study it, in part because um, there's a lot more family transitions going on in households. For example, in this, the study I did, we, we took a calendar of, of who did you live with during your growing up years, and, uh, you know, as more time passes by, the, the, the kinds of families that people are forming and who's coming and who's going in the household, uh, it, it's getting more complicated. So it's, it's, it's not easy to say, oh, I grew up in a single family household or with a step family because quite likely people are experiencing both of those things now today for some period of time. Right. So uh, what does science say about children in, in, in these different forms of families? Is, uh, is intact biological family with married mother and father still the gold standard of social science research? It is. Um, when you think about taking out all of these possible transitions in a, in a household, you know, being born into a married mother and father's household, their biological union, and staying in that household throughout their childhood uh, remains the most stable and, and, and uh, best structure in terms of the, the child being poised to be a productive adult and emotionally the most stable. Right. Well, the, the people who, who are critical of these kind of issues, they, they, they always point out that, that children do grow well even if they don't have married mother and father. And, they can. And, and sometimes a married mother and father can be actually even danger to the child sure. in some cases. Sure, right. One of the things about social science is we talk in generalities and average experiences. Um, whereas people live their lives, um, you know, they have kind of one shot at things. And so they have their own personal experience or the experience of family and friends, uh, which can be different from when we're talking about averages. So it's, it's a little frustrating for me as a social scientist to, to talk about these averages. And people will say, well, you know, that doesn't comport with my own mm. personal experience. I'm like, well, I'm not trying to denigrate your experience, but I'm saying when we group together uh, 
thousands and thousands of cases and we look at their collective experiences, this is still the, the, the best structure when married mom and dad and no transitions, right? But you think about all the possible transitions people can make, you know, uh, born into a, an unmarried union, father leaves, mother forms a new relationship, that lasts for a few years perhaps, then something else happens and then you start to see, well, yeah, that can, I mean, a child has to get used to so many people coming and going, it's not good. Yeah, the instabili instability harms right. the, the, the development of the children. And that's agreed upon. I mean, mm. even my critics will say, yeah, instability is probably not good. Now, we're getting used to instability because it's almost becoming standard. Um, but we're still on the same page, I think, that instability right. is not good. Right. Okay, well, so, so that is the, we might say that there is a broad consensus on this <laughs> issue. Instability harms children. And that is married still true. In, yeah, a married, intact uh, mother and father are still the gold standard for child development you know, in, ge in dispute, general. People will dispute the gold standard stuff. Right. But uh, there's a lot of cases of it, right? I mean, it's still a, it's, I'm not sure it's the norm anymore, but it's still enough of those that uh, we can say, on average, that's the best. Okay. Uh, as a social scientist, you have uh, now come across with a different kind of claims about the different kind of consensus, namely about the children growing up in a same-sex families, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which you studied yourself. Uh, we've heard here in Finland a claim that there are no difference between children uh, who are grown up with with the uh, two men or two, two women compared to these uh, heterosexual families. Right. So uh, is there such a consensus? And how, where, where does this claim yeah. no difference right. come right. from? Uh, there is that consensus in social science. I just think it's a consensus that is premature and certainly debatable. And part of the, the reason uh, I pursued this study was to sort of evaluate that consensus, especially when you compare it to stably married mothers and fathers. Some of this consensus comes from studies comparing different forms of um, basically household upheaval or instability. So when you evaluate um, same-sex single parents versus opposite, you know, a, a, a one-parent family, right? If the mother is a lesbian and the mother is straight, and how do those two children fare? versus uh, a step-parenting arrangement with two women versus a man and a woman. Um, so a lot of the consensus in this has come from studies comparing similar kinds of, you know, what we would once call family in, dysfunction. Instable right? family forms. Right. Could, right. Is, are there forms of instability different from other forms of instability? But I still think that we have to keep in mind this gold standard because we want to know what's best for kids, right? Not just how, how destructive are different kinds of dysfunction, right? So some of that consensus comes from studying similar kinds of, of family breakdowns and family transitions. Uh, so the, the cons consensus exists. I, I, I've admitted that. I've never said it didn't exist. I think it's premature and it ignores um, keeping your eye on what is optimal for children. Uh, is this consensus based on certain type of studies in, in terms of their quality yeah, and methodology? That also is the case too. I mean, we need to take a step back. I mean, in the United States, uh, the, the matter of sexual orientation is so discussed on television and, and radio and in the newspaper that it's, it's so common that when Gallup polled people about how many, how, what percentage of the population do you think is gay or lesbian, people said 20 to 25 wow. percent, right? In reality, it's generally somewhere between roughly 1 to 2 percent for among women and 2 to 4 percent among men. So public perception right? is... Oh, it's way out, of, yeah. way out of kilter. So one of the problems here is that given the reality is that it's a small population, and then smaller still when you talk about those among them who have children, smaller still among those whose children stay with them and not with the other parent, smaller still among those who've stayed with their parent the entire time they were growing up. We get a, uh, what 
a sample size problem, right? Which creates a statistical power problem. Mm -hmm. Which the, the challenge with that means you've got plenty of opposite sex parents around, so even stable ones, right? It's, it's still almost the norm. But when you talk about do you have stable same sex parents who are raised a child from birth or near birth all the way up to age 18, you get down to very small numbers. And when you compare them, you don't have a sample size large enough to detect differences that exist. So some of the time in some of these studies, when they have 44 kids in the study or 78 children in the study, comparing them to potentially hundreds to thousands of kids who grew up in stable opposite sex households, you don't have the sample size to detect differences. And so what you declare is, we don't see any differences, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's a statistical power problem some of the time, right. right? You can eyeball the differences just by looking at sort of the, the, the means or the average uh, scores, but you don't have the sample size for it. So and this is in, when you do a, typically when you do a, a nationally representative population, because if it's a population of two to four percent, half of whom are parents, a fraction of whom have had stability in their household, it gets to be a very difficult statistical problem. So you cannot say uh, too, too much gener generalize it to the larger population. It's difficult. Right. So a lot of the studies have not attempted to do so. Yeah. They've only said, we're going to recruit a population. Well, then, then you have a hard time comparing them to, well, are they like the rest of the population? The, the parents average. themselves evaluate their own children, maybe. And right. So okay. one particular study called the National Longitudinal Lesbian Family Study They've been published 26, 27 times in peer-reviewed articles hmm. based on a sample of 78 children. So the who 26 have been studies on 26 the same... 26 studies of the same 78 kids, right. followed for over uh, two decades now, right? And they were recruited from lesbian bookstores and political events. Hmm. Their parents were, their mothers were, uh, in Boston, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C., 20-plus years ago. I mean, I say these are the 78 most influential children in American legal history mm. because they've been tracked. And so one study like mine, one peer-reviewed study, mm. nationally representative, is compared against dozens and dozens of small sample studies mm. who we don't really know if they're like the rest of the population. In fact, we know that they're not mm. because when we do assessments of the U.S. Census about same-sex households, when we guess at it because they didn't ask about sexual orientation we see that the, the, the share of the population who, has, uh, who are same-sex households with children doesn't look at all like the National Longitudinal Lesbian Family Study. Right. It's much poorer, much less white, much less well-educated. Mm -hmm. right. But I want to go after what's the average, what's the, the national scene, not make assessments of small Right. Non-random samples. So, so, so that there are these uh, methodological problems and limitations. Mm -hmm. Of course, all research has its Absolutely. own limitations. But, right. but, but uh, in terms of trying to generalize the outcomes of yeah. those earlier studies and small samples, uh, has huge problems. Your study, uh, which has a long title, how different are the adult children of parents right. who have same-sex relationships? Findings from the new family structure study tried to overcome and did overcome these sample size problems, namely that you had thousands of respondents, right. uh, and, and that was a high quality first, I guess, uh, in, the, in this term. Can you explain what, what the, were the findings and why it's important? Right. Part of the, the, the challenge that was posed to that study and the critics were, was that because it was the first one to really contest this consensus. Mm. Um, so we interviewed briefly over 15,000 Americans between the ages of 18 and 39. It's a random sample. Ask them a few questions about who they lived with while they were growing 15, up. 15,000 is a lot more than 78 or... It is. Now, that, that's among all Americans, right, uh, between age 18 and 39. 248 of them identified that their mother or father had had a same-sex relationship while they were growing up. Okay? Now, people want or expect them to be, have been, you know, stably in, in a household that was mm -hmm. stable, Two moms, two dads from the get-go. Somebody, some of your critics accused you of, of cherry-picking only the instable I had nothing uh, to do with that part. <laughs> you know, I mean, they can criticize my analysis of the data, fine. But, uh, you know, I, we, I pooled together a, a, a solid team of researchers to help 
pulled together like how, the, the protocol for how we were going to assess this. And given that we were looking at 18 to 39 year olds, people who are grown up now, talking about their past, um, we decided to, to, to go at it in, in the sense of tell us about your mother or father and their same-sex romantic relationship behavior while, while you were growing up. I mean, it could be when you were a baby, right? if you were adopted into a same-sex household. But by far and away, the most common scenario was they were born into a heterosexual union that then failed and that at some point uh, in their life, their mother, far, at least twice as often as their father, uh, formed a same-sex union of some duration. Very few of them lasted very long, right? So critics come along and say, Mark, you only have a handful of people who were raised stably uh, in a same-sex union, so you don't have what you purport to, to, to have. Part of the problem is I never purported to have stability or lots of cases of, of uh, consistently together parents. What I had is social reality, and that's what, mm -hmm. I'm a sociologist, I want to know what's going on out there. Uh, reality as it yeah. is, not as I want it to exactly. be. Exactly, I mean, that's our job, yeah. right? In this domain, it's so fraught with right. idealism that uh, the, the critics were essentially criticizing social reality, or people's use of my study, more than they're criticizing the study itself, but they want, hundreds and hundreds of cases of stable same-sex parents. And as a national They're sample, not it, you're not going to find, I mean, it's like needles in a haystack, right? If you're, so there are other studies that have come after mine that I think are better than mine. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands of cases in federally funded studies. Um, there you're apt to get a few hundred right. of the stable cases. And we still see the same thing there. Uh, Professor Regner Regneris, um, what were your key findings? You, sure. you, you, you studied or you looked at outcomes in children in mm -hmm. 40 different measurements. Yeah, that's also one of the uniquenesses of the study is it's not just about, you know, some sort of uh, emotional outcome or making progress in school. It was 40 different questions about their youth while they were growing up and about their current state today. So among the sample uh, who said their mother had had a same-sex relationship, about 24 or 25 of those outcomes were statistically significantly different from kids who grew up in a married mother and father. So situation. challenging the no different. They're, they're all because more challenging. I mean, you'd think if there was some sort of random chance to it, some of them would be in positive directions, but they're all in negative directions. Now, critics would come along and say, well, these people, I mean, how do you know they were raised by such a parent, right? Well, and, and I described it, especially in my follow-up response to the critics uh, that appeared a few months later. Which most of them haven't read. Right, it. right. Um, when we divide, some of them didn't live very long with their mother and her partner. Sometimes the partner wasn't in the household, but just she had had a relationship with them. Uh, that was definitely the case with fathers, because if we look back in time, there was very few two-dad households with children, you know, 20, 30 years ago, right? So people think, oh, well, then you shouldn't be comparing them to married stable moms and dads. I think, but part of me is like, we should always be comparing them to what we know is the most stable form of, of child development. So uh, 25 out of 40 different uh, outcomes were uh, statistically significantly different for when, when their mother had had a same-sex relationship. I think it was 18 or 19 for when their father had a same-sex relationship. But they were much less likely to live with their father. Mm -hmm. However, and then we get into talking about, well, what does it mean to be raised by someone, right? And then when you think about all the family transitions that people are going through today, well, what does it mean to be raised by someone, right? Um, I mean, absent fathers in terms of, you know, people who have joint custody, they still see their dads, right? They still see their moms. So um, this is the, the ceiling and research here is not real high, right? Which is part of the reason why this sort of consensus is, is ludicrous, it's ridiculous. The ceiling for what you can even know is, is not that high, especially when you're talking about small groups of people. And then you want, as I said, you slice the pie ever narrower and want to know more and more about fewer and fewer people. It's very difficult. Can you describe a little bit more de in detail, elaborate on the, on the outcomes? What did your study find? Sure, right. So adult, some, of the, children. some of the outcomes were like uh, more likely to be unemployed as, as an adult than if you had grown up with a stable 
mother and father. Uh, poorer, more likely to uh, be in, currently in counseling for some sort of uh, psychological or relational issue. Um, obviously more likely to self-identify also as gay or lesbian yourself. Uh, and that for a long time had been this kind of open secret. And now, I mean, I, I can't think of a data set that doesn't reveal that, right? Yeah. I mean, part of this stuff is socialized. So, um, oh my, out of 25 uh, different outcomes, some of them are about the, the, their, their feelings towards their family of origin, the safety they felt uh, in that family of origin, looking back upon that. And some of them, of course, were current day things less likely to be married, more likely to be cohabiting, things like that. So are all these outcomes something that, that uh, in, in lay terms, we would say that, that children don't uh, develop as well in, in same-sex households as they would develop with the married mother and father? If you're talking father. about individuals, right, we can find examples of people who have, have sure. developed fine. Right. Like a divorced families and, and yeah. And, uh, right. I mean, of I know lots of people, and as you do too, that, who fared well in spite of the odds against them. We call that resilience. Right. Right. But when we take the thirty thousand foot view, we recognize that the odds are, uh, you know, are against that in the sense of you're you're less apt to develop as well psychosocially, emotionally. Um, uh, economically, educationally, when you are not in a stably married mother and father household. So now, it, would, it, it would be wise to promote stable marriages instead of promoting totally, other kind right? of family forms. Yeah. And, and you know, governments are starting to sort of play neutral on this stuff today, right? I mean, including my own U.S. government. With the, sending the signal that, you know, relationship forms, family forms, they don't really matter, which is ironic given our president talks about father absence as being a problem. Like, well, there's a good way to get a father involved in the household you know, it, when they're stably married to mom, right? And stay in the household. Uh, governments can't play neutral without significant cost, right? When we know that for decades, the, the, the most stable family form is this. Mm. It's also the cheapest family form in terms of government, yeah, and, and, you know, spend, yeah, right. you know the, the evidence, so you know, single parents are going to need more help, right? Especially single mothers, uh, financial help, etc. And child this, care. this doesn't mean that they are they're they're not doing their best or or, <laughs> they or are. they're not good parents or things like that. Yeah, this We're is not about, about like their structure. talent. Yeah. Right? yeah, This study and very few of these studies are actually about parenting quality. Mm. They're about the assessing truth. family structure differences and looking at how are the children faring. We don't really know what's going on inside the households. A few of the studies talk about like, well, are the parents arguing with each other and arguing mm. with the kids? You know, that's all fairly normal in lots of different households. We want to know like, how are the kids doing? Our, our time is almost up and, and I hate to, <laughs> hate to say that, but, but your study, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, was first uh, among um, several other studies that have yeah. come recently mm -hmm. that are based on quality samples of large random uh, nationally representative samples. Yeah. What are the findings of those kind of right. huge studies that right. I've done in opposition to those earlier? A set of them came after mine, uh, directed by Paul Sellens, he's a sociologist uh, in Washington, D.C. He's using the National Health Information Survey. He's got more cases to draw from, so he also is enabled to look at uh, more same-sex households than I did, right? Which is fine. I mean, I'm, 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 not, I'm all about advancing the science here. And so he finds comparable things that I do. He has fewer outcomes of interest that he's looking at. But um, there, too, the gold standard is obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, and also there, too, the instability is, is, is in other family forms is obvious. I mean, I am convinced that... Everybody who's dealing with nationally representative data in this domain knows what the story is. It's how they present the information to the people, right? In this, I, I talked about instability and what do you do with instability. Others have come along with my data and said, hey, if you control for our household transitions, people coming, people going, you're 
effects change and that there, we see no differences. The deal is, it's an indirect effect, right? That same-sex households are more apt to fall apart mm. in my data as and other data, studies. as we've seen in lots of studies, right? There, and, and instability, of course, back to our consensus, we know that instability is bad for children, right? So what happens if 95% of your population of people who have had same-sex, parents who have had same-sex relationships exhibited some degree of instability in household? You control for that, and all of a sudden, your handful of cases, they turn out okay. And I, I've admitted that multiple times. I've, I've, I've nothing to hide here, so to speak. Um, uh, but if in, instability is an endemic to the kind of relationship structure, shouldn't that matter? I mean, can't we talk about that? And people have said, oh, well, as soon as we have same-sex marriage online, that will disappear. Mm. I'm not stable. convinced it will disappear, right? I mean, s scholars and theorists have been talking for some time about how um, the instability may actually be a function of sort of these modern relationship forms. We're less invested in children and stability and marriage, so why would we be surprised? Right. Well, Professor Ragnaros, it's been a delightful uh, chance to talk to you and, and hear from yourself about these studies, because well, of course we can we can read a lot of text writing about you, <laughs> but uh, it, it's fantastic to hear your own thoughts. And of course, your studies are all online. There is actually a fantastic uh, website called uh, Family Structure Studies, which has diagrams and and very nice uh, um, way of presenting it. Uh, what is your next project? Your next about? project actually has almost nothing to do with this. It does have nothing to do with parents. Um, it's it's a book that assesses sort of the influence of technology on mm. uh, our sexual relationship patterns today. All right. Professor Ragnaros, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very thank much. You for having me. Raamattu sanoi, että jolle sanaa opetetaan, se jakakoon kaikkea hyvää opettajallensa. Tämä kanava on yksi väline, joka tuo sinulle kaikenlaista opetusta Jumalan sanasta ja tuo sinun kotiisi jotain arvokasta. Mutta näiden ohjelmien tekeminen ei olisi mahdollista ilman sinun apuasi ja tukeasi. Jos haluat tukea näitä ohjelmia, niin voit tehdä sen esimerkiksi soittamalla lahjoituspuhelimeen numeroon 0600100777. Puhelun hinta on noin 10 euroa. Tai antamalla lahjasi ruudussa näkyvään tilinumeroon ruudussa näkyvällä viitteellä. Jumala siunatkoon sinua. Kiitos sinulle. Tavataan tällä kanavalla.